Thank you very much. Um, there, there are two questions. Uh, one question I cannot address. And that question is, would uh, the Chinese government actually initiate war operations? Would it go to war? I can't address that because, uh, as you know from recent events, uh, Putin's war in Ukraine, uh, back in 2003, uh, the George Bush war in Iraq, uh, national leaders who can are quite capable of starting wars they cannot possibly win. And uh, that is true of Russians and Americans, and it's even more true of China, of course, because after all, um, in uh, the Chinese government decided unilaterally, unilaterally, that they did not want to accept uh, Japan's turn to neutrality back in, uh, you know, ten years ago, before twelve years ago when there was a neutralist-oriented government in Japan for the first time, uh, the Chinese government decided it's a very good time to start a big fight over Senkaku. And to make it really a big fight, uh, attacking a Japanese business in China and tourists and so on. Uh, so secondly, uh, the Indian prime minister, Mr. Modi, uh, met Xi Jinping uh, seven times, perhaps eight. He had two one-on-one -on -one summits. And after that, the Chinese government decided that it's not enough for them to give the United States a strong Japan ally. They decided they want to give the United States also an India ally by crossing the border in Ladakh, starting fights, and so on and so forth. So, Given the way actually these uh, countries behave, uh, you cannot make a statement whether a country will or will not go to war. War, they are perfectly capable of doing of going to war. My what I can talk about is something different, which is: Can China go to war? Can the People's Republic of China, as it now exists, actually wage a war? I don't mean a big war, I don't mean a world war, a nuclear war, no. I just mean a small war. Can it wage a war? As such as, for example, a war uh, to take Taiwan. And there, there are facts on the table. And uh, the fact number one on the table is that um, the, there is this English uh, word which has become very important, sustainable, sustainable. When you fly now with all Nippon Airways, uh, at Zeniku, they tell you our airline is sustainable, okay? Sustainable means, can you do it today? Can you do it tomorrow? Uh, are you going to destroy the environment and things like that? No, you're not. You're going to be sustainable. Now, we saw the Russia war in Ukraine. Well, this war was not planned well. Uh, the only people who believed that they would win was the uh, Kremlin friends of Putin and the Central Intelligence Agency. Central Intelligence Agency believed that Russia would win. And that's because they believe in these things called information war, cyber war, hybrid war, fourth generation war. And they the most highest complement is non-kinetic or post-kinetic. Kinetic, as you know, means the war where somebody hits somebody. You hit them on the head, you shoot him, he shoots back. Oh, that's terribly old-fashioned, terribly old-fashioned. Now we have information warfare. We have all these advanced forms of warfare, and the CIA believed uh, that they work and so on. So, uh, in that context, Russia, nevertheless, launched a war based on the wrong war plan, invading Europe's biggest country with a very small army. Uh, when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, I happened to be in Prague, actually, when the invasion happened, and 
Czechoslovakia is approximately one fourth the size of Ukraine. Also, it's narrow and long. Since the Soviet Union was invading from East Germany south, from Hungary north, from Poland south, and Ukraine west, they were able to put in 400,000 troops in the first 24 hours. And within 48 hours, 800,000 troops. So I was in Prague, and I was just visiting, of course, but I thought it might be a good idea to throw a Molotov cocktail or two at these armored vehicles. But it was impossible. There were Russians everywhere. Now, instead, they invaded Ukraine for only one direction and with a very small army. A very small army. Why? Because of the, it's going to be not conventional kinetic. No, it's going to be a coup de main, a super fast a cyber. Ukrainian soldiers would be looking at their iPhones and looking at images and hearing words, and they would surrender, of course. And in fact, the CIA persuaded uh, President Biden to offer Zelensky evacuation because they were going to be in Kiev in 24 hours. And once they're in Kiev, the armored column would go through the Ukraine, spread out, and capture the whole Ukraine in four or five days. These are the kind of things that people believe when they start wars. But the Russians did start with the wrong plan, which is normal for the Russians, I suppose. They always don't do very well the first year or two of all their wars. The first year or two, really, they don't do well. But war is sustainable. The Russians have a sustainable war. Like, like these airlines that want to be sustainable and stuff. Why sustainable? Well, first of all, Russia does not import food. Russia may import some uh, special pâté de foie gras from Paris, but food, the Russians make the food they eat. Second, Russia does not import energy. And it has its own energy. In fact, it exports energy. And third, they have the most valuable commodity of all, which is that um, the Russian army can enter Ukraine, they will lose the battle, then they start calling more troops. And in fact, the famous mobilization of 300,000 reservists, these are people who served already in the Russian army. They're not 18, they're not 20, they're not 21. They are older people. The mothers will not jump in the square to stop that. And they mobilize 300,000. Approximately 200,000 arrived. The others, some of them escaped. Some of them went to hospitals and got themselves very good. Uh, they bought very good medical tests that really guaranteed that they wouldn't be caught. And so, but anyway, they got 200,000 signed up. And then they started adding them to this very small army. Because remember, they invaded Ukraine on February 24th with a very small army. And now of approximately 132,000 soldiers, including everybody. Now they mobilized these 300,000 reservists. And even though so many of them didn't come, finally they got 150,000. Now, these reservists went into combat. And of course, some were killed. Then the other people who got killed were the Wagner mercenaries. They got killed. Then there was the Luhansk, Luhansk regional force. People got killed. Donetsk, and finally the actual Russian armed forces from the first day when they arrived in the airfield outside Kiev with helicopters, because this is postmodern war. So you few soldiers with helicopters seized the airfield then the airlift comes in and everything's done so nicely. But anyway, those people also got killed. So they, there are different casualties numbers, but the lowest number, the lowest, absolute lowest number of killed Russians, dead Russians, is a, a minimum number like 25,000. That's minimum. Now, you will notice that Mr. Putin is president of Russia. Everything continues as normal. And 25,000 soldiers, they can lose 25,000 soldiers in several months, and it makes no difference. It really makes no difference. Nobody is blocking the streets in Moscow in protest. Uh, it's 
it can continue like this for a long time. In other words, the Russian government invades Ukraine and makes a mistake. That's very often happens. The same as the Americans made a mistake in 2003 invading Iraq. Both time, both places, by the way, both cases for the same reason, which is the actual research done before invading a country is less than that done by a tourist who wants to, who likes to go scuba diving and wants to go know whether to go to Palawan or to go to uh, Maldives or to go to Seychelles. They do more research than governments do when they invade. So this may be true. Now, let's compare the Chinese story. First of all, China imports animal feed. It imports food as well. But the animal feed it imports 95 million tons of soya beans, plus approximately 20, 30,000 tons of, of maize, maize, wheat, uh, wheat, maize, sorghum, millet, and these other things to feed to animals, to feed to chicken, to pigs, to mutton, because there is a mutton demand in China. The Hui don't eat pork, they like mutton, and of course, beef. In addition to meat, also making products are, such as milk, even yogurt, cheese, and so on. All of this China makes. Largely, although there are still big imports, big imports of chicken parts, of um, beef, different kinds of beef, some pork imports, and there are, of course, dairy imports, a lot of dairy imports. So China is a protein-eating country, and the protein is important. Now, whatever else may happen, the moment a fight of any kind starts, even a small war, G7 type sanctions start, so no ships are loaded where uh, to to the, to China because lots of the soya beans are loaded from U.S. ports from San Diego up to Portland, from Vancouver in Canada. A lot of the soya comes from North America. These ships don't get loaded. Uh, other soya comes from uh, Santos, the port of São Paulo, Brazil. And those don't get loaded, of course, because the Atlantic coast of, of uh, Brazil is an ocean too far, too far. In those conditions with sanctions, there will be an insurance problem. There'll be a port problem. Same thing in Argentina. No way they're going to load ships. No way they're going to be ships crossing the Atlantic, going around the Cape, passing into the Indian Ocean. No way at all that they will arrive in China. So in other words, once China begins war operations, uh, whatever happens in the war fighting, there's no more animal feed entering China. So it means that within about three months, they'll have to kill all the pigs, or mo I mean, uh, not all, but uh, most of the pigs and the chicken, the mutton, the beef. There'll be a lot of meat eating in China, uh, but then it ends, then it stops. And when it, now, I lived in China, I lived in Beijing for uh, several weeks. Uh, uh, in 1976, Mao was still alive. He died while I was there. I was actually invited to go to the Great Hall of the People to look down and see Mao, dead Mao. So I was living in Beijing and nobody was starving. People were thin, they were thin. They were much lighter than today's Chinese. They didn't weigh so much. They didn't have muscles. The young boys were not tall, they were short, but they were definitely surviving. Yogurt did not exist. Milk hardly existed. Beef was something that maybe a very clever family could get hold of enough every 10 days, every 10 days to have a little piece of beef. Chicken, more easily, maybe a big, clever family with the hardworking people, they could get chicken, could share chicken or something. In other words, Chinese people were self-sufficient. Under Mao, China sometimes exported rice. It did not import food. 
Nobody had yogurt, nobody cared, and so on. So China used to be self-sufficient. In other words, it used to be the way Russia is now for food. And now it is completely different. In fact, I was very interested to see the lockdown in Shanghai. During the COVID lockdown in Shanghai, the municipality provided great big uh, crates of food, uh, boxes of food. The food was 10 times better than the food the Chinese people had in Beijing in 1976. But the people in Shanghai said they were starving. They said, we're starving. We can't eat this stuff. Why? Because they didn't have yogurt and things like that, products that didn't exist in China. So China used to be self-sufficient, and it's not. The reason it's not is because the Chinese leadership failed to do something that Stalin's leadership did in the 1930s. In the 1930s, when the Russians industrialized, they accepted a much higher cost in order to move, do, develop the industry in the Ural Mountains, 2,000 kilometers east of the Moscow, the, the, let's say the central line of Russia. They built up the industries in the Urals, in Kazakhstan, and they paid a big price for that, big price. But then when the Germans invaded and conquered Western Russia, it turns out that this is what saved the Russians because they were producing tanks a thousand kilometers east of the German army instead of, well, all the Germans had overrun, isolated the Leningrad tank factories, Kharkov was overrun, etc. The Chinese leadership failed to do that. They could have channeled development in China, the, uh, the you know urban development, factories, houses, and so on, could have channeled it so that they are preserving arable land, land, arable land, land where you can cultivate things like soya, things like rice, and so on. They did not do it. And only about 10 years ago, they started passing rules that you cannot convert uh, our agricultural land to develop housing or industry and so on. Now, I've traveled all over China. I've been in the north, I've been to in Mongolia, I've been to Yunnan, I've been to Xinjiang, I've been to Tibet, and all through Xi'an and everywhere else. Plenty of space in China to have developed industry without converting farmland, rice land, and paddy to that. But they didn't do it. And when they passed the rules about 10 years ago, since that time, since the day when they passed all kinds of rules, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, China has lost another 6%. So China is a country that doesn't starve, not at all, but where there's no protein. So if the Chinese leader who starts a war, who said Putin starts a war, now we are in nine months of that war, and still people in Russia, they eat the same food they ate, uh, six months ago, a year ago, and so on. There's chicken, there's beef, there's everything they want. Um, in China's case, starts a war and food. There's no, there's still lots of rice, plenty of rice. There's some frozen pork. Uh, the quality is not great, but you know, and that's it. Okay. So China is not self sufficient for food. And no country that is not self-sufficient with food can start a war unless they're sure that they will win very quickly. Not only win. I mean, everybody who starts wars believes that they will win, of course. Um, and that's a very easy condition, to believe you're going to win. But also they have to win quickly, quickly. Uh, and that is unlikely. Then there's the issue of energy. Russia is self-sufficient in energy. China, on the other hand, is the world's biggest importer of petroleum. The, where does the petroleum come from? It comes from the other side of the Straits of Malacca. Uh, that is to say, a whole area which will be uh, also too far, too far, because the Indians control the Indian Ocean. They, con they control the entrance of the Straits of Malacca, and they don't have to do much to prevent, you know, so forth. So, uh, and of course, uh, China is a huge importer of liquefied natural gas from Australia, from all kinds of countries. Those imports will also stop. However, 
those imports are not so important strategically as food is. Because first of all, China has a large domestic production of petroleum and gas. Secondly, there are pipelines from Russia, Siberian pipelines, which are bringing oil and gas. There are pipelines from Kazakhstan bringing oil and gas and pipeline from Myanmar. And then there is something very important, which is a lot of the Chinese energy demand is for the export industries. And of course, the export industries would stop immediately. As soon as there's any warlike action at all, the G7 sanctions start, exports end, there's no exports. Therefore, there's no demand for energy for the export industries. A lot of the energy demand in China is from export industries. If the exports stop and production stops, of course, people will be unemployed. There'll be millions and millions and millions of Chinese people who have no work to do because the export has stopped, the export production has stopped. Uh, but the fact is that the energy demand, therefore, will fall a lot as soon as a war starts and a G7 sanctions start. So energy is not so important. First, as I say, domestic production, China produces a lot of petroleum, more than in the past. They're using high techniques to recover more petroleum. They're using advanced recovery techniques to get more oil from rather old fields. Secondly, the pipelines for Siberia, Kazakhstan, there's also a small Myanmar gas uh, pipeline that brings gas from Myanmar. That plus that, and thirdly, in wartime, it is quite easy to ration some energy use, which is, for example, tourist flights. Tourist flights back and forth uh, uh, to go to Lijiang, to go to Guilin, to go to the beautiful places in China. Those flights can stop, obviously. So energy is not the problem. Food is the problem. And now the issue is how important food is. Uh, whether people will say, well, you know, it was very important to get Taiwan, very important to get Taiwan. We have to unify Taiwan. We must unify Taiwan. This is terrible. About, and that's why we must, uh, we don't have any meat. So we're very little meat. We don't have ice cream. We don't have milk. We don't have all these things. Um, we're going to be tough, and it's more important for us to have Taiwan. Okay, so all of this is one side of the story. But then there is the other story, side of the story. Now, back in 2000, and that is something more important than food. What's more important than food is dead soldiers. Dead soldiers. If you want to fight a war, you need to have a supply of expendable soldiers, sailors, airmen, and so on. You, you cannot start a war if you're not willing to tolerate casualties. Now, many years ago, I published a theory called post-heroic warfare. Post-heroic warfare. I wrote a series of articles in Foreign Affairs, and my argument was terribly simple, really simple. It is that the wars of history were fought by spare male children. They were, the wars of history were fought by families where there were three boys, maybe three boys, four boys, unusually two boys only, and one boy never, uh, or hardly ever. So you have three or four boys. One boy inherits the family land. The other boy might marry a girl who has land and some. A third boy will do something else. And if one of these boys goes to the army and does not come back and is killed in war, the family emotional economy can accept that. You, After all, you're a parent. You have three boys. You lose a boy. It's very sad, very, very sad. But uh, you accept it. Now, what I wrote in my articles on post-heroic warfare, which have generated the literature, if you look up post-heroic warfare, a lot of the stuff is not written by me, but by other people who have developed the argument of post-heroic warfare, they started looking, etc. 
And what has happened is that tolerance for casualties, the acceptance of casualties, has gone down everywhere. Uh, let's say uh, in 1944, June 6, 1944, on Omaha Breach, there was a mistake. Uh, the Omaha landing, this is the Normandy landings of 1944, and there were different beaches. They landed at Utah Beach and different beaches. The Omaha landing was a mistake. 2,200 Americans died in one morning. 2,200 died in one morning, but the war continued, uh, and that was it. Um, there was a, you accepted the fact. Uh, in Vietnam, the United States lost 50,000 over 10 years, not one morning to 10 years, and that was considered very traumatic and very heavy uh, to lose uh, 50,000 over 10 years. Uh, of course, uh, since that time, society has changed further. American families are smaller. So in American families rarely have more than two boys. And most of them have only two, you know, two boys, or three boys maximum. The four or five boy families don't exist anymore. So uh, tolerance for casualties has gone down a lot. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that if you go in a place like Iraq and you lose a or Afghanistan, you lose a few thousand, that's okay. But what you can't do is to lose 10,000 dead before breakfast and continue normally. So that is the post heroic change. Now, let's look at China's situation. Uh, according to the post heroic model, China, uh, with uh, most Chinese families, have one child. One child, only one child. This is supposed to change. There's a policy now encouraging families to have 10 children or 15 or 20, I don't know, but certainly more than one. However, this will not have any impact for 20 years or so. The policy just changed. The party said, don't make children. Then the party says, make children, but people uh, you know, they take a few years to make children, and then if they need to grow up, they have to become 20 or so. So the China that actually exists is what I call a post-heroic China. It is a China where the acceptance of casualties, according to this model, okay, the model is that when families are very small, there are no spare male children, then families and society and the culture and the government all have to reduce casualties. We know that Russians can lose several thousand, you know, they can lose thousands without any real change. Um, the United States can lose hundreds without real change. But in 2020, in the Galwan River Valley of Ladakh, uh, there was this fight between um, a night fight. It was uh, during a night, um, a fight between uh, PLA troops and Indian troops. They did not use guns. They did not use firearms. They didn't shoot each other. It was a fight done with sticks wrapped in barbed wire, maybe iron tubes, all kinds of stuff. And uh, approximately... Um, 20 or more than 20 Indians were killed. And uh, the Indian army took the, one of them was a brigadier, was a one-star general commanding a battalion of the Bihari troops, specially trained for mountains and stuff. So when these fight occurred, oh, the, the, uh, the Indian army gave the, the, the dead to their families and therefore there were funerals in different parts of India, different fun funerals. Um, and uh, the media, the press, would go to the different funerals and see. So basically, the Indians knew exactly how many people were killed. In the Chinese case, China was silent. No statements. Silence. How many Indians died? Just look at the funerals. There were no funerals. There was no statement. There was nothing. Then, seven months later, after seven months of preparation, there was a, the announcement came out 
then there were four killed. The first one was an officer. The officer had a wife. The wife was a music teacher. And what happened is that the, by the time the announcement was made, after eight months, the music teacher had become, uh, got, received a position as a music professor at the Xi'an Musical Conservatory. I'm, not, I'm pronouncing Xi'an the way we pronounce Xi'an. Xi'an is a city where there are the terracotta warriors and all that. It's the ancient capital of China. Now it's a rather grim industrial city, quite a big one, with a university that is specialized in, in the, the West, you know, Iranian culture, Middle East culture. And uh, it also has the... Um, the factories producing jet engines, also in Xi'an. And in Xi'an, there is a music conservatory that is a high-level musical school. By the time they made the announcement after seven months, the widow, who had the child, had been relocated from the little place to Xi'an. A house was built for them. I'm sure, a very nice house. And she got this important teaching position in the highest musical school. That's what they did for the officer, dead officer. Now, then there was a soldier who was very young, terribly young, looked like a teenager. And his media presentation is then make him look really young and very cute and really uh, charming, like a beautiful little boy kind of thing, and to make him a hero for young people. And then there was a third fellow, and who he was the uh, good guy. He's the good guy. He's the one who says, I must, I will give my life. His statement is, I will give my life to defend the motherland. Every inch of the motherland, I'm here to defend every inch. It's not Beijing. It's not Shanghai. It's up there in Ladakh. In Ladakh, which most people don't think is it's anything to do with China, far away from China. There are no Chinese who have lived there, no Chinese there. Yeah, but he is going to defend Ladakh, every centimeter of Ladakh. That's his thing. And his mother, when the seven months passed and he was announced and he was given his own media presentation and great treatment, the mother made the mistake of being very enthusiastic. She said, yes, defending the, we must defend the motherland, the motherland, okay? This is Ladakh, okay? Long way away. It's like, I don't know, Japanese defending Manchuria or something like that. Manchukuo, Manchukuo, Manchukuo. So, but the mother was very enthusiastic. She said, yes, we must defend, we must defend. So the Chinese Weibo, the Chinese social media, started attacking the mother for being too enthusiastic about the death of her son. And then there was another media intervention by the government to defend the mother and son. Finally, there was number four. Now, number four was presented as very traditional, very traditional. And he has written a letter before he died, right? And this letter wrote that dear father and mother, Actually, the Chinese official, the, uh, not official, the translation in Global Times was mom and dad, mom and dad, in very American English, very American. Dear mom and dad, I'm very sorry that I will not be there for you when you need me. Uh, but if there is an afterlife, which is interesting that, you know, People's Republic of China, they're not supposed to be an afterlife. That implies that he's some sort of Christian or Muslim or something. Afterlife, after your death. Then I hope to be there with you. Finally, there was the issue of the funeral. By the time the funeral was conducted, in the town where he lived, there was already a statue of him in a memorial hall uh, there was an existing memorial hall. They put in an exhibit for him. Now, the only thing is that the parents had to cry. True, the event takes place seven months later, but the parents have to cry. They have to cry spontaneously, as if they just heard five minutes ago that he's dead. Now, why did the Chinese authorities 
do this entire preparation and this our action uh, because evidently they were concerned about the public reaction. This was entire operation was to reduce the emotional impact of saying that four people died in order to move the Chinese line forward in a place that has never been considered by the Chinese as Chinese. Okay, maybe officially in the classroom they say, yes, this is Chinese territory, but it's not as if it has any past in Chinese history, any Chinese ever lived there, any Chinese ever visited there, there was any Chinese government ever present anywhere near. So, in other words, a government that has to carry out large-scale preparations that take eight months and work on the families and make sure that none of these family members say one word against the fact that their son died. Because you give them, you know, the widow is there, the parents, everybody so elevated and rewarded and paid off that they were not going to say a word. They're not going to complain. And this is for four dead. Four dead. Now, four is not a number in war. A low number of dead in war is 4,000. There is a fight over Taiwan, more like 25,000. 25,000 people can die in one day. After all, they're on ships. And these days, as you know, uh, there are only uh, targets and submarines. Targets and submarines. So uh, it doesn't take, uh, there is an invasion of Taiwan. Of course, these ships will be sunk. They'll be sunk. It doesn't matter how many American ships are there. There may be very few, but there'll certainly be lots of submarines. The US Navy, once upon a time, it was distributed in the North Sea, in the Arctic Sea, in the Mediterranean, across the width of the Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. Today, they don't have any work to do other than in the South China Sea, East China Sea area. So uh, the aircraft carriers will, uh, will be there. And if they're not only two aircraft carriers, that doesn't matter. If they're damaged, also doesn't matter because aircraft carriers are the ships of the past. Uh, the, you know, the past, they, they were important, but you know, today nobody, in, to stop somebody invading an island, you don't need the aircraft carriers. You have submarines. And the thing about submarines is that two or three are enough. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, two or three Japanese submarines uh, could sink every ship of the Chinese Navy that is worth a torpedo. Uh, Torpedoes are very expensive, and the Japanese torpedoes are really expensive. So the question is that if the government of Japan decides that they don't want to see Taiwan conquered, um, they don't have to bomb Beijing or do anything like that. No, no, no. They just, you know, there'll be some ships sinking. Who knows who sank them? Whose torpedoes they are? We don't know. Uh, and of course, the Americans will sink uh, the ships. And they, the they don't need one aircraft carrier around. They don't need a cruiser. They don't need a destroyer. Because what they're doing is they're stopping an invasion. Now, if if any submarine experts are here, they will tell you that the waters of Taiwan, to, between Taiwan and Xiamen, or Amoy, Amoy, the whole bay there, the waters are shallow. They're not perfect. But, you know, the thing about submarines, they don't have to be perfect. Um, and nuclear submarines are very patient animals. They don't have to rush there or go back and forth for beautiful fuels and so on. So if there is a fight over Taiwan, it will not be for that. It will be more like 4,000 or 40,000 that just, you know, as a result of sinkings. That's the thing about navies, you know, they get sunk. I mean, uh, these days, uh, they they cannot not be sunk. Um, it's just one of those things that technology changes and it evolves. And at this moment, uh, submarines are serious. 
and everything else is not so serious. So that is what you're going to have. And the issue is that today, does Mr. Xi Jinping, when he talks about Taiwan, about we must have Taiwan, we must do this and that, whether actually uh, he accepts all this, whether he thinks that the Chinese people will gladly do without chicken and beef and yogurt and milk and cheese and so on, uh, most of these things didn't exist in China when I lived there first. So I find it I would find it rather strange that Shanghai people complained there wasn't fresh dairy products. Um, there, but anyway, the issue is will the fact that China cannot fight a war without losing a lot of people quickly, very quickly. Now, the country that spent seven months preparing carefully the presentation of four dead for the fighting in the dark would now have to deal with 404,000 or 40,000. Uh, this, uh, all of this doesn't say, doesn't tell you anything about whether uh, there will not be an, an attempt to attack. Uh, but uh, I think that... Uh, we can't, no. What we know is that if China starts a war, it will have to stop. It will have to stop quite quickly because the regime or the leader, whoever it is, will discover that he doesn't have what the Russians have. The Russians have many defects and many shortcomings, but they, uh, they have the largest country in the world and nobody gave it to them. Nobody gave all this territory to Russia they got it by winning wars and winning battles and usually doing very badly the first year or the second year, losing uh, this time only uh, maybe 40,000 dead or 50,000 dead. In, in the other wars in the 20th century, they would lose a million or two million before they started. Uh, you know, it's a problem in Russia because Russia has always been a dictatorship whether of the Tsar or the Secretary General of the Communist Party. And under dictatorship, the people who become top generals are the ones who know how to play politics around the ruler. They are not promoted within the armed force by professionals for professional reasons. They're promoted because the top ruler favors them. Now, Putin's taste in generals was a poor taste. Putin chose Gerasimov, General Gerasimov, I'm afraid, not good. His Minister of Defense, Shoigu, who goes around in uniform, never served in the armed forces for one day. He's a Tuvan, uh, interesting character. Uh, but uh, now he had to, Putin has, that's a usual thing with the Russians. They start a war, and after a year or so, the good generals start, and and they can do it, and eventually they can win. I don't know if the, in Ukraine case they're not going to win a beautiful victory, but they could do a counteroffensive and and uh, reestablish a bit their the reputation for being effective military power. Uh, they can do that, and along the way they lose eighty thousand dead, a hundred thousand dead. So what? That won't make any difference. Nobody is in the streets of Moscow. Nobody is in the streets of Pittsburgh. But I believe in China's case, a government that was afraid to declare that four people were dead uh, would have real problems if they fought the real war and they lost 40,000 people in a week, which could easily happen. Um, now, in regard to the United States, it's different uh, because the, it, it took 10 years Let's say the stupidest war fought in the, century, in the 20th century was the Vietnam War, because the Vietnam War was fought to keep China out of Vietnam, because these communists would invite the Chinese communists to take over into China. In other words, nobody read a single book about Vietnam history. Nobody uh, knew anything about Vietnam. Nobody went there. So they fought the stupid war, but then they lost 50,000 over the years. Why did they lose 50,000? Because they kept failing 
and losing 5,000 or so a year, and they could continue losing 5,000 or so, until finally too much. Uh, so a war very far away that was wrong from the first day, you could still lose 50,000 dead. Now, in Ladakh, four dead turned out to be a big thing. Final remark is that I personally find it difficult to hear any analysis of Chinese foreign policy or strategy that omits the fact, that excludes, does not include the fact that China provoked Japan, brought Abe Shinzo, the great man, my friend, whom I missed, um, raised Abe Shinzo because of pushing on Senkaku, and now they've kicked the Indians, pushing in Ladakh until the Indians are, can no longer be neutral and have to be our allies. And I'm very grateful to them uh, for doing that because American diplomacy could never have got the Indians allies. China has been able to do it. So I'm not confident, I'm not at all confident that the fact that China cannot fight the war means that they will not try to fight the war. That I can't tell you. Seeing, uh, you know, just the reality of life. Um, Thank you very much, and um, uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to such a distinguished group of people in such a distinguished institution that I have known for many years and respected very much. Thank you.